Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Ooh, all right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors mm -hmm. <laughs> and shapes. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Nonprofit U, a forum where nonprofit stakeholders can share lessons learned and discuss the latest developments in the industry. My name is Valerie Leninger Holt. I'm a consultant to nonprofits, and I specialize in community and organizational development. I work with nonprofit organizations to help them make a stronger impact to their clients and communities. You can find Nonprofit U on Facebook and on Twitter. I encourage you to follow us and to comment early and often using the hashtags Nonprofit U or Promising Programs. You can also leave comments on blogtalkradio.com forward slash nonprofit underscore U. The chat room is open and you can post comments and questions. In order to use the chat room, you must open a listener-only account. You'll find a link to open the account on the page of this episode, and you can also email me questions at consulting at ValerieFLeonard.com. We'll be taking questions by phone and from our chat room at about the 20-minute mark or so, and the call-in number is 347-884-821. Again, that number is 347-884-8121. Today's topic is developing promising programs. We'll talk about community needs assessments, logic models, evidence-based programs, data collection, and program evaluation. So you can see we have quite a bit of ground to cover. And again, we encourage you to call in with questions at the 20-minute mark. You can start posting in the chat room right now, and you can also email me questions right now. Again, my email address is consulting at ValerieFLeonard.com. If you want to participate in a live chat, you must open an account, and the link is found on the episode page. Again, at the 20-minute mark, please call in at 347-884-8121. We're especially encouraging nonprofit and community development professionals to call in to share your war stories and your strategies. So I want to talk a little bit about developing promising. And before we talk about developing promising programs, we just want to clarify what a program is because so often we get programs and services confused. A service we know is a group of activities that are sponsored for the, the public good, so to speak. We know that there is some good, but we can't really prove it because there's no intentionality. And when I say intentionality, that means we haven't really put any goals and objectives behind this. On the other hand, programs are a set of activities that an organization engages in to meet very specific community needs that have been documented, and they also have specific goals objectives, and outcomes. And an example that I like to use to be able to tell the difference between a service and a program is, say, a meal at a soup kitchen versus a diet. A soup kitchen, we know the meals are nourishing, we know the meals are good for you, but typically soup kitchens just document your name and address and tell you how many people came through their doors. They're not necessarily... You know, unless they have developed a specific program, but they're not necessarily trying to figure out what the impact of that food is on the people who come through. On the other hand, when we go on diets, we have a specific purpose. We have specific goals and objectives. We either want to lose weight, we want to reduce our high blood pressure, we want to reduce our blood sugar, blah, blah, blah. So we eat specific foods at a specific time and a specific amount, and then we begin to measure the impact of that diet. So ideally we want to have lower blood pressure, we want to have lower blood sugar, we want to have lower weight and all that good stuff, lower measurements. 
and we can tell directly if there has been some impact because we eat prescribed foods at prescribed times, and then we can measure our before and after. So that would give you some some indication of what the difference is between a diet and a soup kitchen, but most importantly, a diet would be considered a program that has intentionality for change, and a soup kitchen would be considered a service where there is doing you're doing some good, but we just tonality around it. And that's important because you want to develop programs with some impact. And I guess the highest standard is an evidence-based program, and the evidence-based programs are those programs that have been found to be effective based on a very rigorous evaluation process. Typically what happens is they have clients and then they divide them into two groups. There is a certain intervention that they want to test. And when I say intervention, you know, there is some remedy to a quote-unquote problem or an issue and they want to test to see if that remedy or if that intervention has any effect. So they'll separate their participants into two groups. They will have an experiential group, um, and they will get experimental, I'm sorry, experimental group, and they will get the intervention, and then they will have the control group, and that control group gets no prescribed, and then at the end of the program period, they compare what happens to each group, and ideally the group that got the intervention will actually have better outcomes. So they can say that as a result of our program, X, Y, Z occurred. And how do we know that? Because the control group didn't get the intervention and they didn't have the outcome that the, same, that the group that got the intervention. So once you go through that process, you will have a peer review to look at your methods and your outcomes, and then they will agree or disagree. And then often that review is done by a government agency as well who will give their blessings, and then they will recommend this as a program that has been um, evidence-based. And you don't necessarily have to go through a government agency to say that it's evidence-based, but you know, often that happens. And quite frankly, most of us never, ever get to the point where we have an evidence-based program. One, we don't have the capacity. Two, we don't have the time. Three, we don't have the money. What many of us end up doing is licensing programs that are evidence-based or we'll look at an evidence-based program and replicate, you know, bits and pieces of the model, but that doesn't necessarily mean that our program is evidence-based because once the program is evidence-based, it's uh, actually done on certain, within certain communities under certain conditions, and it's hard to replicate those conditions exactly from community to community. So typically what we want to aim for is a promising program, and those promising programs are programs that have been evaluated to show significant effects, but they haven't yet met that scientific um, criteria but just because you don't go through a scientific rigor doesn't mean that your program has no merit and that you should not pursue it. So there's a group, Blueprints for Healthy Development. They have set criteria for promising programs, and they have four basic criteria, and basically they're saying the program description clearly identifies the outcome the program is designed to change, They have evaluations in their trial phase that produce very valid and reliable findings. And when we say reliable, you know, it happens over and over again. And then the evidence from those evaluations indicate that there's a significant positive change in the intended clients or intended outcomes that can be directly attributed to the program And the program is something that can be replicated. That means it's available for dissemination. There are manuals available. There's training. 
and technical assistance and other support that other people who want to replicate your program can, in fact, use. So before we get to all of that, we ourselves need to focus on the community needs assessment. And I see my friend, Reverend Marcus Tapp, Senior, has joined us. Hello, Marcus. Thank you for joining us. We're talking about a needs assessment now. And a needs assessment, basically, in an ideal sense, rather than focused on the deficit of people, focuses on their strengths. So you're going to identify the strengths and resources that are already available in the community to meet the needs of your target. And the assessment should focus on the capabilities of the community, and that would include its citizens, agencies, and organizations. And it also provides the framework for developing and identifying services and solutions and building communities that support and nurture, say, children and families or anybody who is in our target area. So there are a number of tools that we can use for community needs assessments. You can use surveys and questionnaires to get a sense for people's attitudes about issues or about a particular product or service. You can use interviews to speak with people, you know, to get behind those numbers. You can look at the literature, look at what the experts are saying and, you know, use the nuggets to help shape your program. You can conduct an asset map where you can literally map the location of services that could help your target, or you can do a diagram, you know, that would basically list out the, the different services or people who, who could be able to help your, your client. And what that asset map does is it focuses away from deficits and needs, what, what's wrong with people, and focuses on solutions to problems and, and the potential that is within the individual to help overcome his or her issue. Other community needs assessment tools include things like focus group discussions, and basically what that is is a group interview, and then you can get public meetings. Now, for example, if you are working with prisoner reentry, if you want to do a community needs assessment, some of the things you might want to consider are things like how many ex-offenders are returning to the community, who's impacted, what problems they face, what do they need to successfully transition back into society, what services are available to them, how well the services work, are there any gaps in the programs and service, and if so, how can our organization actually fill those gaps so that we're not, you know, reinvent, reinventing the wheel. So once you have identified what's going on, you know, in you know, in your particular market or in your particular community, then you want to set goals and objectives and key indicators and indicators or measurements. Those are things that you'll use to actually measure how close you are to reaching your goals and objectives. So if your objective or your goal is to actually enhance or improve performance of students in, say, third grade, one of your indicators will be, say, reading scores or, you know, the, the percentage gain um, in reading. So, I mean, depending on what your industry is, you know, those indicators are going to vary, but you want to get relevant indicators that will actually let you know whether or not you're getting close to your goal or objective. So I want to remind people that you're listening to Nonprofit You. I'm Valerie Leonard. I'm your host. If you have any questions, we'll be taking them at about 2.20 or so, the call-in number is 347-884-8121. Again, that number is 347-884-8121. Going on in the community, you have set your goals, 
your objectives and you figured out how you're going to measure progress toward those goals and objectives, it's very helpful and I would strongly recommend that you develop a program logic model. One, it helps you to really grasp what your program is going to look like and you can do that really, really quickly. You know, It helps you to... Uh, to cut down the time that it would normally take to develop a program. And it also is a really good tool to help you, you know, flesh through, you know, ideas and you can see at a glance what's going on in the community and how you're going to address the issue. So a program logic model does, it gives you a snapshot of the environment and given what's going on in your current environment or the situation, then you develop your goals and objectives, and then you identify the resources that you need to meet those goals and objectives, and then you identify the activities that you're going to use, and then you will also identify what change you want to make or what outcome. So all of that you can be able to to see at a glance, and then once you have that picture down, you can begin to write your narrative as to program is. And you should use this during the planning process, during the implementation, I'm sorry, during the implementation process, as well as during the evaluation phases. That way, one, when you come to your evaluation, you're not necessarily trying to back into the data that you're going to collect and all that good stuff. And I should have mentioned that your program logic model ideally should include um, the data that you collect, who's going to collect it, and what interval. Um, <clears throat> and you want to make sure that you check it again in implementation so that you can tweak your your program for any minor adjustments that need to be made so you can maximize your impact. And then you want to use it again at the evaluation phase, and that will help you do a postmortem, so to speak, to see what worked with your program, what didn't work, and all that good more when we talk about evaluation. But once you develop your program logic model and you develop your program, then you've got to put the meat on the bone, so to speak. You need to develop what we would call program infrastructure, Um, Just like, you know, for cities we have streets and sewers. Those would be considered part of our infrastructure that that makes cities like Chicago the the city that works. Um, You have program infrastructure. These operational systems keep your program working. So you'll be doing things like developing your operating manual. You'll be hiring staff. You'll be developing your budgeting and financial systems. You'll be engaging in fundraising, developing a fundraising plan, um, assessing the risk and developing uh, or buying insurance, you know, for for liability, directors and officers and all that good stuff. You'll also, if this is applicable, be doing outreach and registration to get clients. You'll be engaging in, well, you'll maybe buying property, to house your program or you'll be renting property, you'll uh, have maintenance contracts, you'll be looking at compliance and legal issues, making sure that all your licenses and certification and professional services contracts are in place. You'll look at, you know, if there are any partnership agreements, um, if there are any annual reporting requirements, all of that stuff you know, that nobody really thinks is glamorous but really makes a big difference. You need to make sure you have in place and let's not, you know, forget about marketing and outreach. And once you have all of that at least outlined, you need to develop a work plan. And your work plan will talk to you about how you're going to implement your program. It will give you a list of tasks, who's responsible, talk about the due dates, and then you'll have a place where you can talk about status and be able to explain any variance 
from the work plan? Like, you know, you weren't able to meet a deadline. Why? You know, what were some of the issues? And it's important for major stakeholders. You know, you can't go around assigning stuff to people who are going to be doing the work without consulting them, you know, because your expectations may be totally unrealistic if you're not actually the one doing the work. And every program, goal, and objective should be consistent with the organization's mission, vision, and core values, and the work plan should be monitored regularly, and you should look at what you actually accomplish versus what you plan and make adjustments as necessary. Sometimes our plans can be too ambitious, but, you know, it's always good to to have a plan and have you know, and be able to monitor the work plan. And when it comes to evaluation, basically you want to know, you know, did our program achieve the desired impacts and outcomes? What could we have done differently or what can we do differently depending at what point you are doing your evaluation? And how does this information impact our future program development process? You want to make sure you incorporate new learning into future program development. And then you also want to make sure that your data collection methods are such that they're integrated into the day-to-day programming so that it does not feel like extra. So I want to remind folks that we are open for questions. You're listening to Nonprofit U. The phone number is area code 347-884-8121. Again, that number is area code 347-884-8121. And I see my friend J.P. Paulus has also joined us in the chat room. So if you're in the chat room, you can feel free to type in any questions. And if you're in the listening audience and you want to make a call, again, call us at 347-884-8121. So the timing of your evaluation is important. Um, You could do a formative evaluation or you can do a summative evaluation. And your formative evaluation is usually done very early on into your implementation process. And you want to do a formative evaluation to check on your program, you know, make sure that it's running smoothly, make sure you're getting some of the desired outcomes, and if not, you can make your adjustment. Your summative evaluation occurs at the end of a project period, say a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, agreement is with your funder, depending on what your board decides. But the summative evaluation is just that. In summary, what has happened um, with this program and you have two major types. So there are several types of evaluation, but the two most common are outcome evaluation as well as process evaluation. So when we talk about outcome evaluation, we're really looking at assessing the effectiveness of a program in producing the desired change. So, for example, if I had a smoke cessation program, my questions, and I want to really formulate these questions at the beginning and not at the end, and the reason why I do this is because I want to know what types of data I should be collecting during the implementation process. So when I get to this point of evaluation, I know not only uh, what I'm looking for, but it won't be like trying to find a new one in the haystack. I won't find myself actually backing into a result. So, for example, you want to know, did the program succeed in helping people stop smoking? Was the program more successful with certain groups of people than with others? And what aspects of the program did participants find gave them the greatest benefits? And when we look at process evaluation, we're really looking at how well a project works. It allows a nonprofit to look at how it develops what we call infrastructure again and how the infrastructure helps to achieve the desired outcomes. So these include things like our organization structure, management systems, 
that would include your financial system, supporting programs like communications and marketing, and even fundraising in order to get the outcomes that everyone wants to achieve. And the focus of a process evaluation is on the types and quantities of the services delivered, um, and then also the clients, not so much the change, but how, you know, just how many people are going through the program, the resources that are used to deliver the services, and the practical problems that were encountered in trying to deliver the services and how the problems were resolved. So I uh, shared all of that, you know, just to give you an overview of how you should go about developing promising programs. And really, you know, the, the main difference between a promising program and a quote-unquote program is the evaluation. And you want to have a reliable evaluation, and it would be great if you could have, you know, an, an evaluation at more than one point so you can establish that there's some consistency, you know, that your results were not just a fluke, but, you know, this is consistent. And then once you can, you know, demonstrate that your evaluation process is a reliable process, it's a high-quality process, then you can um, feel, you know, some assurance that your program is a promising program and it would help too, if, if you had some peer review of your findings, you know, to kind of sign off on it and document that it is an acceptable program. And the reason you would want to have a promising program versus quote unquote a program, one, you want to be able to show that the results that you've been able to achieve are reliable. It will be helpful, you know, if you ever wanted to expand, you can demonstrate that you have something that works so you can begin to scale this. Um, If there are other people in other parts of the city, other parts of the country that are looking to do a program and they see that your model works, then they'll start to borrow elements from your program. You can also use these these programs in your advocacy as you advocate to, say, legislative bodies or to various foundations the need to release more funding in that area. And you can't do that without having the evidence that you have. So I hope that's been helpful. And this really brings us to a close unless there are any other questions I'm going to leave. I'm going to ask one more time if there are any questions from our audience. The call-in number is 347 884 8121. Again, that number is 347 884 8121. And if there's anybody in the chat room who has any questions, we've got a little bit less than two minutes left um, for any questions that you might have. So it, at this point, it doesn't really look like we have any questions. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I encourage you to join us next week when we will have Joan Gary. Yeah, Joan Gary is a national figure. She professor at one of the East Coast universities, and she also does her own consulting. And she and I will be talking about various topics in nonprofit leadership. So until then, I will see you next week. Oh, and I. Thank Marcus Tad. He um, indicated that he thought the information was great, and he thanks. So I I appreciate um, your comments, Reverend Marcus Tad, and I hope that you, know, you can use this information in the future. And for any other guests, if there's anything that I've shared, I hope that you also can use it. So until next week, I want you to take care. And I look forward to a lively discussion with Joan Gary. Take care. Bye-bye. When we go out to eat, we never agree on where to go. I want burgers. Pizza. Tacos it is. The one thing we do agree on is we all want unlimited high-speed data. That's why we switch to Metro PCS. Stop by Metro PCS with the whole family and get four lines with unlimited LTE data for just $100, period. 
Metro PCS. Wireless. Figure it out. Coverage not available in some areas. Offers require reporting of number not currently active on T-Mobile Network. During congestion, the fraction of customers using more than 35 gigs per month may notice reduced speeds. Video streams up to 40p. No tethering. See store for details and terms and conditions. Get to Old Navy two days only today and tomorrow. Wrap up Old Navy's PJ pants for adults for just five bucks. That's right, five bucks. Don't sleep on it. It ends tomorrow at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 1215 to 1216. Select styles only.